without further got it okay so i think we are live now yes we are live and uh, let me just go back there and open up those cases i have them so uh, welcome everybody this is our clinical case review and we have a new moderator christina thank you for moderating this thank you for having me dr Vasi. well thank you now if you have question um you can message christina and uh, christina will you know organize them and ask them and then we will go over them uh, as our uh, typical kind of uh, uh, case is i'm just going to bring films and then uh, we, uh, we will uh, put them on and, and we ask a question with the people who are already online. But if uh, uh, you have more question, um, uh, you can uh, uh, message actually Christina. So I'm going to go as well online on my TikTok. Okay, so cl clinical case review starting. Okay, have a fun case review, guys. Thank you. Okay. Wow, that is, these are good cases. So, Christina, since you are the moderator, let's uh, you do the first one. What do you see? Okay, let me just get all these boxes out of my way. Okay, so this looks like, uh, I would say, a pelvic... Uh, is this a CT? That or is correct. That is a CT. How do you know it's a CT? Uh, just based on, um, I don't know, just how it looks, I guess. Should I give you a tip? Sure, yes. The tip is, look at that very, very white stuff. Yeah, the hardware. Metal. Mm -hmm. The metal is very, very white on CT, whereas in MRI, Metal doesn't have hydrogen, protons, and MRI measures the density of protons. Yes. Okay, or, or hydrogen, mm -hmm. okay? So, because it doesn't have water, practically MRI measures water. Metal has no water. So mm -hmm. in MRI, you don't see the metal, you just see a shadow, a dark spot in the metal. So every time you see a metal a screws as you see so clearly white, it's automatically going to be a CT. So, okay, but this is a CT. Tell me more about this CT. What do you see? Uh, so I think this is a like pelvic CT just based on um, the lower lumbar spine being visible as well as the, um, just like the sacrum, um, the pelvis and yeah. Yes, it is a structure. It is a lumbar. I'm sorry, it's a pelvic CT. And if you would want to add to that, this view, what would you call this view or this series, this uh, kind of picture here? Is the coronal, axial, or sagittal? This one. Uh, is this sagittal? It, on, this is on the right side. It's the what is the view? It is a horizontal view of the pelvis. What is that call? on the axial? Axial, exactly. Okay. That's axial view. And here, if you just look at that, what mm -hmm. do you think what this is? Is that the sagittal view? The sagittal would be the side view. Do you think it's the side oh, yes. view, the frontal view? No, this is the, like the coronal view. I can't right. remember. Frontal view. Frontal yes, view the is the frontal. coronal view. That is so, let's start with few interesting things in the coronal view. Mm -hmm. Um. Obviously, you just, we talked about the metal. You see the metal here. Mm -hmm. You see those two, um, like an oblique kind of bone? Yes. Coming out. What bone is that? Um, so would those be, the tips would be the ASIS? Um, what, what's the name of the bone, this bone, right here and here? What is the pelvis made of? What's the biggest part of the pelvis? Uh, so the sacrum would be in the center. Correct, um, correct. 
on either sides of the girdle, would it just be like the um, ilium bones or like the iliac crest? Yeah, correct. And those pieces of bone are iliac crests. Mm -hmm. them. And uh, obviously, if you see the iliac crest and mm -hmm. if you see the sacrum between them is a joint, which we call the iliosacral joint. Yes, we call it sacroiliac joint, but iliosacral, I like that actually better. That sounds like a good name. So we call that sacroiliac joint. Now, um, we, if you remember, we had a podcast, we talked about the sacroiliac joint. Mm -hmm. What is special thing about the sacroiliac joint? And we can pass the torch now. To, so I, I can torture somebody else. Lucas, it's your turn. Are you there? Yes, I am. Good, Lucas. What is special thing about the sacroiliac joint? Why is it the sacroiliac joint very different from rest of our joints? Um, <clears throat> is it the type of cartilage that's in there? Actually, you're, you're very close. It's not type of cart uh, cartilage, but maybe lack of cartilage. Mm -hmm. Because we call it sacroiliac joint a joint. It is really not a joint. And in one of our podcasts, I offered $100 to anybody who name a muscle that works only on the sacroiliac joint, meaning it goes from the iliac crest to sacrum. I offered that because that muscle doesn't exist. <laughs> and uh, now they call it like gluteal and so on. But if you look at the anatomy, every other muscle bypasses sacroiliac joint. None of them really works on moving sacroiliac joint itself because sacroiliac joint doesn't really have a motion. As a matter of fact, what do you think, Lucas, the maximum um, motion and what kind of motion do you get in the sacroiliac joint? Um, it, it should be relatively immobile, um, but I, I know that this one is, is fused because... Um, yes, uh, there, on the right side, it's fused, but what is a natural physiologic motion that you would expect from the sacroiliac joint? I would say close to zero. <laughs> Very Actually, good. it's between four and six per, per degree. Degrees, okay. Four and six degrees, really not much. If you pay attention to your elbow or shoulder and rest and see how much they move, and you have a joint that moves only to, uh, the four to six degree. And you know what the motion is called in this, uh, that the motion that's physiologic in the sacroiliac joint, do you know what that motion is called? Um, are you like in terms of directions? Yeah, like we give the name. We give to that name of the. I'm opening up a book here. <laughs> and what do you call when I do this? If you call it open book motion, right. okay. that open book because the, the two part of the pelvis, iliac crest, they open up, they increase the um opening in the uh, aperture of the pelvis so baby can pass through. So Lucas, you and I, we don't need that joint. And even in woman, that motion is just a four to six degree. Now, four to six degree doesn't sound like much, but it actually adds significantly to the uh, uh, opening of the pelvis for the baby to pass through. Do you, do you know what is the, the big problem in our uh, the, the, for giving birth in human, have you seen how an other animal give birth to a baby and how we humans struggle to do that? Have yeah. you, have you seen like, how cows do that? They, they really don't struggle. They just <laughs> they, they munch a little on the grass and they put a baby out and give, go back and munch even more. They don't struggle like human. You know why that is that humans struggle so much, Lucas, for, for giving birth? Isn't it because of the positioning? Is, aren't we supposed to like anatomically uh, give birth like on our hands and knees? Um, yeah, well, the, the, the problem is our big brain, Lucas. <laughs> that big brain requires a big head. And even, even though our brain is not ready, that's why our babies, have you seen a deer baby? It comes out, at the, the five minutes later is jumping around. The brain is ready, myelinated, already ready to go. Whereas our baby, they're lucky if they can just uh, the, uh, suckle and get some milk. That's all they can do. Mm. Okay? 
because our brain is not ready. But even with that big head, um, it is uh, we struggle because of that big head. We struggle, and that four to six degree really help us. Our skull is not even totally calcified. It comes in pieces, as a matter of fact, because of that. So, um, do you know what is the consequence of that big head on woman's pelvis? It is that we have a lot of women, as a matter of fact, the rate of sacroiliac joint disease is seven, 10 times higher in the first two years after uh, delivering a baby. Oh, wow. Seven times higher. And another thing that makes sense now to you, women are statistically more likely to get sacroiliac joint disease than men. And uh, the, the, what, so obviously looking at this picture, Let's move on to John. John, um, are, are you going to be able to answer some questions? I promise you it'll be all benign. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. John. So John, um, looking at this uh, coronal view, um, I'm going to go through certain structure. You tell me what you think they are. Would that be okay? Sure. First of all, let's start with the obvious thing. Are you able to see my cursor? Yeah. What is, where am I? What do I, what am I pointing to? What is this cursor on? Uh, like nothing on the patient. Is, is outside that of the outside? patient. Yeah. Air, that's air. What is this? Um, is that just subcutaneous fat? And that is another thing that helps you to recognize CT versus MRI. Nine out of 10 times in most of sequences, if, except if they have a so-called fat suppressed MRI, which is a rare sequence, fat in T2 and T1 will be white. So if you see fat dark, you can, you can assume this is a CT, not an MRI. Again, if it's a fat suppressed MRI sequence, uh, the, the, uh, but that's a rare sequence. Otherwise, fat is white on MRI. Okay, now I'm coming further in. What is that? Uh, looks like uh, looks like a muscle. And there are two of them, uh, two muscles, right? Yeah. What muscles are they? That's an advanced question. What muscle do you think like they are? A, like a gluteal muscle? Yes, yeah, absolutely right. These are the gluteal muscles. Now, then I'm coming farther in. Do you see, you remember you said this is outside, this is air? Mm -hmm. There's bowel. There are bowel. What am I pointing to? What is that? Would that be like the rectum? Correct. And what is in the rectum? That why is that white thing? That it's a uh, stool. That stool. stool it's how stool look like in this uh, in a CT. Okay. Now let's look at a few more things. I see obviously this patient had a lumbar fusion as well. Mm -hmm. that, you see this sacroiliac joint on the left side not fused. On the right side is fused. Do you see the structure of the sacroiliac joint? How irregular it is? Yeah. And uh, that is how even a normal sacroiliac joint can look like. So one thing you want to learn from this meeting today is that the appearance of the sacroiliac joint does not make the diagnostic of the sacroiliac joint disease. Because a, a sacroiliac joint, even in a normal person, does it is a very atrophic, very a variable kind of joint. So I cannot just look at the picture, say this patient has sacroiliac joint. Mm -hmm. It's a clinical diagnostic, okay? Now, um, do, do you, where, what am I pointing right now, John? Um, is that like L5? Very good. That is here. L4. Obviously. And yeah. do you see that there is a bone growing from L? Five to S one. Yeah, it's kind of conjoined there. Well, we don't call them really conjoined. We call them a successful fusion. Okay. It has a, a adequate fusion in the L five S one and as well in L four five. You see that white material, not as solid as here, but it's going across. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the we talked about that. that so let look at the um uh, Maliha burner. Maliha, would, would you like to answer me a few more questions on the on the axial picture? I want to 
make you understand you eventually you guys will learn to look at different picture and make a 3D mental image, a model in your brain. But truly you have to get used to this anatomical uh, views, standard views, and then put the information together. And then uh, all of that will make sense to you once you put that picture in your brain. So Maliha, uh, is that, did I, do I pr pronounce your name right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, now let's look at the axial view. Um, what am I pointing to, uh, pointing right now here? Um, bowel. Again, bowel. Is it rectum or is it bowel? It's bowel, it's not rectal. Why is it not the rectum? Because it's kind of suspended more um, anteriorly and it's not yeah. closer to where I would expect the rectum to be. Correct. The rectum would be in the almost here closer to the midline. Correct. Very correct. So, and this is the other side. One of them is ascending, one of them is descending. You want to guess which one is ascending, which one is descending? Um, I'll do my best. Let me orient myself. I think the one on the left side is ascending and the one on the right side is descending. The right side? Uh, okay. What do you mean by right side and left side? What side am I uh, right? Is it right side or left side? Right here. That's right. patient's right side. Correct. And that is important. Okay. In all so the views, films are like yours. Imagine when you're looking at any films, you're at the bed side, at the feet side of the bed, and you're looking up. And then all of a sudden it makes sense to you. That is always going to be the right side. That is always going to be the left side. But as you see, they put an L here as well. They don't put the R on the other side. They used to, but they assume all of our, all of us are smart enough to know if it's a L is here, then we know other side is the right side. Now, you remember we talked about some gluteal muscles? Mm -hmm. Do you see them here? Um, not as well as the other image, but yes. Okay, yeah, but you see three of them. Yeah. Right? Because we have three gluteus, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a, a little advanced question. Oh boy. <laughs> w what is this here? Um... Here, it is a muscle that goes on the front of the pelvis down. Is it obturator? Yeah, yeah, it could be obturator, but you have a bunch of muscles here in front of the sacrum. They're going down. They go attached to the lumbar spine, and they go all the way down attached to the femur. Do you know what muscle I'm talking about? Iliopsoas. Oh, okay. okay. So let's ask you another advanced question here. Wow, you're going to ask there lots of advanced questions. Now, let's look at the coronal view. Do you see where my cursor is? Yeah, I can see that. What if I would tell you this hole and this hole are the same? And, and I'm going to ask you what, what is that hole and what's in it? Is that like one of the ala of the sacrum? Ala is, ala is a Latin for wings. And oh, I see. This is the wing of the sacrum here and here, but this is a hole in the bone. Is it a tumor? Is the infection? Is it something normal? What do you think what that hole in the sacrum is? Here, 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 and you don't, the other side, there's some more, Artifact, metal artifact, you don't see it, but it's, it's one on the other side as well. So what do you think what that is? I'm honestly not sure. Okay, well, it is a hole that's physiologic and a nerve is passing through that. Do you want to guess what, not, what nerve that would be? Is it the sciatic foramen? Well, we don't call it sciatic foramen. We call it S1 foramen. Okay. Now... I, I, I'm sure you guys have all heard uh, the word sciatica. Let's go uh, back uh, to you, Christina. So sciatica, what does the word sciatica mean? Um, doesn't it usually just mean uh, like radiculopathy of either the nerves coming out from like the lower lumbar or sciatic foramens? 
or I mean, thing. yeah, very good. The practical pain that is in the back of the thigh goes down the leg. The typical sciatica is back of the thigh going down to the all the way down to the foot. And, and why why do we call that mostly? You know, some people come say, "Oh, I have sciatica," and they show you front of their thighs. Why is that not sciatica? You want to get a get, take a guess? Why pain in the front of the uh, thigh is not sciatica, whereas pain in the back of the thigh is very well sciatica? Uh, is it because the front of the leg is not innervated by the sciatic nerve, just the back of the leg is? Very good. Now, what is sciatic nerve? What is it? Um, yes. Uh, isn't it the um, branches like from the lower spine? But I'm trying to think of what levels it comes off of. It's mm -hmm. it's like the um, it's like when I think it's. I don't know, is it like L3 through, oh, let's see here what it says. Sciatic L3 right there. Five. Okay, yeah, so the common peroneal and tibial nerves. Well, you know, let's start with that, okay? Don't, don't get confused with that. Let's start, the sciatica is that when the nerve roots of five, S1 and S2, mm -hmm. and partially S3 come together. Mm -hmm. It's called the lumbosacral plexus. Now, the front of the thigh is what? L1, 2, 3, side of the thigh, mostly L4. Mm -hmm. So you may have radiculopathy to front of the thigh, but it's then not the sciatica, mm -hmm. right? Because sciatica is what? L5, S1, S2, meaning the distribution of those nerves. Mm -hmm. so, um, and that people just uh, sometimes confuse that, but now you know more than most of people. The sciatic nerve is the from sacral plexus, L5, S1, S2, and um, it is mostly back of the thigh going down uh, on L5, turning around the calf to the top of the foot. Typical place is the big toe. And the, the typical place for S1 is heel or on side of the foot, okay? Now, what is important here now, when this pay, when you have a picture like that, and here is the S1 foramen, meaning that in this patient, you have to pay attention after the surgery, especially to S1 nerve root. You go and touch the heel of, that's what I did. I just did one of the surgeries today, just before we taught. I went and touched the back of the, when patient woke up in my post-operative check, I went and touched the heel of the patient and said, how does it feel here? How does it feel? Said, oh, it's, oh, I have so much pain, doctor. Said, no, no, I'm not talking about the back or hip. Do you have any pain, numbness, tingling where I'm touching you here? Said, oh, no, no, it's just my hip. So what does that mean? I didn't put a screw through the uh, foramen of S1. Do you see how close that? Screw is to the foramen of S1. Yes. That is the art of surgery, being so close to it, but not through it. In reality, it's much easier because I have a machine that I stimulate the screw, and if the screw is too close, the stimulation is too high, I just turn it back. A little. So don't get scared. You can do this, all of this. Okay. So um, let's look at this here. Uh, the, the, uh, Lucas, uh, you're back on. Okay. All right. Do you see that this screw on top is very, very close right. to the bone there? Do you see that there? Right. Is that is that bicortical? Did you go through the perfect? You have had you know your you know your bicortical screw. <laughs> you know uh, if that screw comes out of that, what symptom of what nerve I should be expecting? Ooh, that would be so you're not, looking, it, not S1. Mm -hmm. So we're looking between L5 S1 disc space. No, if that nerve comes out there, and yeah. if that nerve that comes out here between L5 and S1, right? Yeah. Runs, as a matter of fact, right there, that is the nerve I'm talking about. 
The nerve that comes between the L5 and S1, what nerve is that? That would be, if it's exiting at the vertebral body, would it be L5 nerve? That's that exactly L5 nerve, okay? Yeah. And let me show you the L5 nerve somewhere here. Then you understand why that is the nerve that you should be concerned about in the screw in that position. Right, for the radiculopathy. Yeah, here. Yeah. This is exactly where that, just on top of this ala, that is where the L5 nerve root is running down, okay? So let's go to next picture. We, I think we sort of uh, did enough here. Ooh, that, that's, a, that's a nasty one. Okay, John, it's back you. Describe what you see. Let's start with the middle one. Let's start with the middle picture and just describe to me what you see. Yeah, it looks like a coronal view CT. Uh, is it a coronal view CT? Or sagittal? No, no, no. You're, you're going the right direction. It is coronal looking because you're looking front to the front of the patient. It is coronal looking. But is it a coronal view or is it something else? What do you think? Like frontal? I don't know. Does it look like a CT or does it look like an X-ray? My first instinct says x-ray, but... Yes, your first instinct is right. Did you know every CT machine can produce a picture for you that exactly look like a CT, exactly look like an x-ray, even though on the bottom it says CT, so the CT machine, I'm not the x-ray machine, produced that. But let me go back again and show you how a chrono view CT look like. Do you see that there? This is a yeah. slice of the body. This is a slice of the body. But this year, practically we use that half a million dollar CT machine to get a regular extra. Mm -hmm. You can do that as you see. And you can do it like a, a, it's front view, AP view as a, a, a lateral view. In the X-ray, we call it front frontal view or AP view and um, lateral view, correct? Whereas yeah. A picture that has this orientation in the CT, we call it chronal, and this view, we call it sagittal, correct? Yeah. So it is practically accumulation of all the uh, uh, x-rays that pass through on the other side. The machine produces you a chronal view. As a matter of fact, every CT that is obtained, first, you have to get these two pictures, what you see in the middle and on the right side. And then you put a box around it and you say to the machine, get me that area, get me a picture, slices of that area. And then you get the axial view and then you produce other views. So even though it looked like a, a, it is produced by the CT uh, and it is, it looked like an X-ray, we call it the so-called the localizer or scout view, scout mm -hmm. or localizer. So these are the scout view on the, in the middle and on the right. These are the scout view of the city. Every city has them. If you, it, uh, usually they are the first uh, sequence on the city. So now, now we know what they are, describe what you see. Um, so there's a few different, you know, pieces of hardware in there. Looks like a right hip replacement. Correct, um, here it is for everybody else. You, you see the right hip replacement, the artificial hip, okay? It looks like okay. a device, like I, I haven't seen one before, but is that a spinal stimulator? You're absolutely right. Yeah. What does um, a spinal stimulation device do? Uh, it helps with pain. So people who have like chronic pain, right? How, can... how does it help you with pain? Um, does it work sort of on like the sensory like mm -hmm. afferents or yeah afferents. yeah very good now are you guys familiar with the anatomy of the spine of the spinal cord um yeah looking at that left picture there looks like uh sort of in the spinal cord that there's something in the lumbar spine that so let's put it this way are oh. you guys familiar with the butterfly in the spinal cord. Are you familiar with that? 
Yeah, it, like and your anterior part, and ventral horns. Yeah, this part of the spinal cord, let me just bring it over here. Well, now what is it doing now? Okay, here. This part of the spinal cord, we call that dorsal column. Mm -hmm. And this is where your sensory, including your pain signal, go up to your brain. Okay? Now imagine we put an electrode on that part of the spinal cord and we give it small little electric jolt. Imagine the sensory, pain is a sensory, like pain is a network cable that sent to your computer a signal that it is, something is not right. That's what pain is. Now, we put on that uh, this, uh, dorsal column, the, the uh, stimulation device, the electrode that you see here, and we give it a lot more electricity. We practically paralyze it by overstimulation, but we do it just enough that it doesn't uh, damage all the signals. Surprisingly and good for human is that the pain, the pain pathways are easily overwhelmed compared to others, meaning that if you choose the threshold just right, the pain pathways are paralyzed, whereas other pathways like sensory pressure and so on, they are not. And so that is how spinal cord stimulation device works. We put electrode, we over uh, stimulate the pain pathways in the dorsal column. And it works pretty well, actually. You know, people who have lots of pain, we put these electrodes and then all of a sudden, the pain is uh, significantly reduced in their, uh, in the lower, especially in the lower extremity. Um, uh, do you guys know anybody who has a spinal cord stimulation device, any of you? If you have them, ask them to show it to you, the, the device, uh, you know, um, as a matter of fact, you know, um, I have a lot of devices taken out of people and uh, uh, I'm going, uh, I'm happy to, if you guys are interested, I'm happy to send you one that you can look at, but they are a huge technology. Do you know how much they cost? They are the cost of a small car. But unfortunately, once they are out, you cannot sell it on eBay because once they are out of body, they don't work anymore and you can control them as well, okay? It's a huge science and it's a common thing these days. Yeah, get to know it. If you have a patient, ask them to show on their cell phone. You can the cell phone can talk to it and you can program it. Okay. If you um now, okay, uh, Maliha, it's I think you're. I like to ask you a few questions. And let's concentrate on the picture on the left side. Can you describe that picture for me? Sure. This is a sagittal. You, it's a CT. Correct. Um, and it's looking at the spine. Of what part of the spine are we looking at? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar? I think it's thoracic and lumbar. Correct. Well, it's mostly thoracic and some lumbar, correct. And here's the heart. You see the heart right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this uh, CT, in the sagittal view of the thoracic spine. So what is special about that CT? What is it here that is different than most of the CTs? It's showing some artifact. You know, that's that. very correct. You see those streak or metal artifact. And again, if you ever see our the, the podcast that we made about the physics of the CT, that makes sense why they look like that. That is true, but there's another special thing about this CT. What do you think what else is special about this CT? That's a good question. <laughs> now, do you see that there is white inside of the spinal canal? Yeah. Usually that density in this kind of picture, I would be concerned that patient has bled. Oh, uh, is this a myelogram? Correct, that's a myelogram. So you wanna describe what the myelogram is? I think it's tagging the CSF. Well, you put contrast in CSF and you get a CAT scan. That's all what it is. Mm -hmm. Put a spinal needle in the interticular space. You give like eight or 10 cc of contrast. I usually give Omnipack. 
which is has a, a, a very dense material for the CAT scan for the X-rays, and then you see uh, where that is, and in, obviously the spinal cord doesn't let the contrast go in, so it's dark, and then you see around the nerves, and that is good for your diagnostic. Did I mean, it's a, it's a good question now. Did this contrast, did what it's supposed to do? Show me the pathology, what the problem is in this patient. That is why we are doing it. To see the contour of the spinal cord, to see where it is under pressure. Did I, did I get the information I was needing from this uh, myelogram? I think so, yeah. It shows you where the stimulator is in the hardware. Yeah, that, is, that is not really, um, I don't need, really need a myelogram for that. A regular CT would show me where the electrodes are, but look at below the electrode. Do you see that below the electrode, the contrast comes in and then stops? There's a hard oh, yeah. stop of the contrast right there. Mm -hmm. That is the value of myelogram, that if you have a, um, a, a stenosis, you don't see the contrast, and that shows you where the, the narrowing in the spinal canal is. As well, I could get an MRI for that, but if you have lots of metal, MRI is not a good picture because you see a lot, you see a big black hole. That is why a myelogram is superior to MRI in situation like that when you are too close to a metal. By the way, would I get, a, would I get an MRI in somebody who have a spinal cord stimulation device? No, I wouldn't. Most of the time, I wouldn't. It's it's just extremely rare and just a new thing that you have this stimulation device uh, or uh, spinal cord stimulation device that you can turn off safely and get an MRI. Now, until recently, that would be absolutely contraindication. For all practical purpose, never order an MRI on a patient with a spinal cord stimulation device. You can have all this metal here and here and get them all right because they are embedded in the bone. And most of the metal these days we put in is actually non-magnetic, like titanium. But this is electronic things. You put it in a three Tesla machine, it fries it. And what happens if you move a wire in a magnetic field? What happens? Hmm? How do we produce? electricity. You put a wire in a magnet, changing magnetic field and we move it. So literally we have two magnets, we have a wire coil between them and we turn them and that's how we produce electricity. Now, do you really wanna produce electricity inside of the patient with the electrode that are next to the spinal cord? No, you don't. So that is why this patient has a contraindication to get um, um, at uh, MRI. Now, um, now let's talk about this hardware, uh, Maliha. What do you think about them? What do you think what they are? They look like screws. They are fusion. Right. They are screws. Patient had a previous lumbar fusion. Now, do you want to tell me what levels those fusions are? Is it visible? Maybe it doesn't come out on your screen as well as on my screen. Um, I want to guess L1 through L5 or L4. No? Well, let's see. This is what here? The sacrum. Sacrum. The next one up should be then what? L5. So is it L2 through L5? Correct. Very good. Okay. Let's Look at the next one. Now, this is our the CT. Now, compare that. You remember we talked about that? Compare this view and this view with this view and this view. Now, does it make sense that what the differences are between a scout, which looks more like X-ray versus coronal and sagittal CT? I'm going to go one time more back. This picture. Here and this versus this and this. Okay. Now we're back to you, Christina. <clears throat> I make it easy on you this time. Okay. You remember this was air? Yes. 
So what is this one? Uh, I think we talked about this one time. Is that yeah. like when the disc degenerates? Correct. But what is it? What is that that makes it so dark here? Um, <laughs> it's like gas from something, but not... Repetition. That's why then you are going to not, you are not going to forget this anymore. Yeah. Uh, there are few places in our body that this dark spot is normal. Right. Colon, mm -hmm. one of the gases that bacteria produce by decomposing our fecal matter, mm -hmm. our lungs, and everywhere that we have. So in our GI tract and in our uh, and pulmonary tract, mm -hmm. that is normal. Mm -hmm. Anywhere else, air is actually a very ominous sign. Why is air in most of, if it's not in one of those two places that we talked about, why is air an ominous sign. Isn't it usually indicative of like gas producing bacteria? Correct. And those are very, very bad for us. They're sepsis. They cause sepsis and they kill you. Mm -hmm. Or you may have an abdominal rupture. Then you yeah. may have air there. Mm -hmm. Now, you can have abdominal air or air anywhere right after the surgery. That is why it's important to know patient's history. If you get it after the infection, I'm sorry, after the surgery, just within the first six hours or a day, Mm -hmm. That's still okay. Mm -hmm. But anytime after that, because air gets absorbed, if you see dark inside of our tissue, it means something is decomposing. That could be a bacterial decomposition, mm -hmm. which is a dangerous thing. You have to act on it. You have to pick up the phone and call somebody if you see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm seeing this air inside of the disc of this patient, and I'm not going to pick up the phone and call somebody the infection disease and so on, why not? Um, we discussed this, but I can't remember. Isn't it from like rupture of the disc? Not the rupture of the disc, but the decomposition, mechanical yeah. decomposition of the disc. Mm -hmm. Why would the mechanical deco decomposition of the disc or cartilage produce gas? And what is that gas? What do amino acids have? proteins have amino acids and amino acids what's the specific thing about amino acids that they're um that they are like carbon chains well that not make them amino acids because uh, glucose and the, the, the polysaccharides are uh, amino uh, are uh, carbon based and chains is the nitrogen yes is the specific part of the proteins that actually makes a protein protein Mm -hmm. And that's actually they have sampled that gas there is nitrogen. That meaning that cartilage and this is mechanically decomposing and mm -hmm. free nitrogen, and that's it, uh, that's called the degenerative disc disease. And that is why you can see this and not uh, panic. Don't panic if you see dark inside of the disc. Um, if you see uh, one day after the surgery. A gas here, still okay, but if, if a week after the surgery, you see gas in the area of the surgery, mm -hmm. then you pick up the phone and make a call right away, okay? That could be a severe uh, bacterial infection. Now, uh, Lucas, we are back to you. Can you describe to me what you see else in this picture and why this picture shows a Post-operative complication. Ooh, a post-operative complication. Yeah. Why this picture shows a post-operative complication? I gave it to you. It's a post-operative complication. Why? What is a screw supposed to do here? Oh, I see the air next to the screw. Which uh, one? Which one? I'm seeing a pocket of air next to L3 body screw. This one? Yeah. Yes. Yep. And then I also see it uh, around the L4 thread. So why, what if I will tell you that what you see the air pocket here is not really real? What, what, what would I tell you that's not real? So I initially figured it was an artifact, but it is an artifact. Yeah. But then you told me it's that what we call a streak artifact. It's streak artifact. And again, please, if you really want to. Yeah, this is one of those things. If you know the physics of it, 
everything makes sense to you and you can deduct lots of things from it. Mm-hmm. So this is not real. This is not air. This is a so-called streak or metal artifact. Okay. So okay. that is not pathology. As a matter of fact, this is normal. Everything you see here is normal. But this patient still have a pathologic screw. One of the screws is not the way it's supposed to be. Okay. Would it be the one at L5 then? You mean this one? No, below that one. Well, is that L5? Uh, L2, 3, 4. <laughs> it looks like it's between L5 and S1 almost. Well, no, it is S1. It is just okay. the way it looks like. Okay. It's S1. Mm-hmm. Why is that Why is that screw not normal? Uh, it looks like the body slipped above it. Well, patient has a spondylolisthesis. That is why... Uh, this patient got the surgery to start with, but what is not normal about that screw? There's no, oh, I'm looking now at the second image. There's no rod that is attached. Um, I don't know if that's relevant or not. Is it? Okay. Well, you, this is very interesting. <laughs> you know, the rod is just is missing here. Yeah. What happened? And, but you know, the rod is missing here too. Yeah. It's yeah, just so not the right cut. You see, this is a coronal view. And in the coronal view, a rod is not necessarily all in coronal view because it bends. So you don't get all the rod here. Don't expect to see all the rod in one view and so on. So all of that is normal. What's not normal is the gap between the S1 screw and the bone. Do you see the gap here? Yes. Now look at all the screws. You see? The bone is actually contacting to all the threads here, here, here. But here, imagine you put a screw in the drywall and you yank on it, mm-hmm. and then there's a gap between the screw and the drywall. Are you going to hang your picture frame on it? No. Because it's not a really solid, and that's what's happening here. The, the S1 the screw is loose. It's a loose, a, a practically non functional. Uh, S1 screw, and here in the coronal view as well, you see there's a gap between the screw and the bone. Okay, that's the post operative complication. Most of the time, people have osteoporosis or are smokers, the bone doesn't grow well, and so on. And they, they do very well at the beginning, and then they come back six months after the surgery, and then all of a sudden the pain is back, and you get a CT like that. You see that the S1 screw is not really solid anymore. Now, eventually, if they're lucky, bone grows, and then the loose screw become less relevant. But at this point, if this patient has a significant pain, that can be explained by the loose S1 screw. Then we have to go there, put more screws, put bigger screws, and so on and so forth. Would you ever fill that with bone um, with with um, uh, bone cement? That I'm happy you ask that. That would be one option, but. It is not as easy of a task as you would think it is mm. to feel that because you have to get to that. Uh, you have to get to that place. The only way to get that place is opening up the patient and taking that screw out because the screw is in your way of getting there. Right. I'm happy you asked that because now we have a method. We have developed a method that with a small, like a Jamshidi needle, which is a 14 gauge or 12 gauge needle, go to that space and put material that make the bone grow. Like, imagine you have a, a, the, you have a the loose screw in a drywall and you go and put more gypsum or something uh, in that hole to make the hole smaller and make that uh, the connection better. Hmm. Is that like a vertebroplasty? Like a minimally invasive? Vertebroplasty, vertebroplasty you would put a metometacrylate, which is a plastic. What we do, we, we do that as well, but what we do, we go and put there something called the BMP, bone polymorphogenic protein. Oh, yeah. Okay. Who, who knows what that is? You want to describe what that is? Yeah, that's, um, well, BMP2, like, are you using BMT, BMP2 then? Yeah, it's a BMP. Well, there is a recombinant BMP2. Practically, mm-hmm. the, the, there's a protein signal to our osteoblast. Go there and build bone. That's a protein, is a and is a signaling protein to the osteoblast become active and it works really well, and we 
uh, we put that material inside of that gap that make the bone grow from outside in. Sometimes as well, we do put metometacrylate, but probably the metometacrylate is if you put it in, you're absolutely going to make sure bone is not going to grow there because metometacrylate is a plastic and is a barrier to the osteoplast, okay? So one, we are, it is almost time. So I'm going to ask you a few more questions. Um, yeah, John, you wanna answer me what nerve this is? I gave you it, it's a nerve. What nerve is this? Um, sciatic. Well, it is part of the sciatic nerve before it becomes sciatic nerve. It's a sciatic nerve, it's a S1 nerve root in the S1 foramen. Mm -hmm. Once it comes out of sacrum, joins the, you remember, L5 and S2 and S3, then it becomes sciatic nerve. So if I push on this uh, nerve here with my screws, John, I'm repeating myself. What symptoms does the patient get if my screw comes out of this uh, bone here and push on that nerve right here? What symptoms? Patient will complain about. Uh, patient will complain about a shooting pain down the back of their leg. Yes, but specifically, but that could be as well L5, back of the leg. But what is it but distinguish that is LS1 and not L5? Um, it would be like a specific location. There yeah. Probably like higher up, like maybe in the like the buttocks. No, actually not. Is that or the down? It's side or down, like in their foot, maybe heel and outside of the foot. Okay, that is one. Top of the foot and big toe is L five. Okay, but you're right. Higher up, it would be um, S two and S three, which is around our perianal region. And if you look at the dermatomal maps. Yeah, there is an anatomical reason why we jump from the S1 and S1 being side outside of the foot to the and heel to jump to uh, S2 and S3 being in the perianal region. There is an anatomical reason why this is like that. And whoever, this is the last question we are going to answer. Whoever uh, get it, uh, answer me why this jump is, is going to get a nice t-shirt from us. Who can tell us why it jumps from heel to perianal region? S1, heel, S2, perianal region. Who, who, who can tell us? I'm just going <laughs> to guess, like maybe that's like a nerve comes off of S2, S3. Like uh, like the perineal nerve or something like that? No, no, it is way more deep than that. No, way deeper than that. Huh? Any any takers? Is it because during embryogenesis we we um hot? You are getting hot. Yeah. <laughs> so we. Oh man, is it the limbs they grow later? Like they grow. Yes. Faster? Sometimes in your life, you look like this, like little worm. And then your leg grew from notochords. And the S1 and every notochord make you grow a vein, an artery, and a, and a nerve. And they grow, that's why they're always together. And at sometimes your butthole was next to your heel before you grow your legs. Okay, that is why the S1 and S2 and S3 are the way they are. You didn't have legs, you were like a little fish. And then at that time, S1 and S2 were next to each other. Now it just happened that you start growing leg there. And then the S1 got so far away from S2, okay? So you said that, so uh, connect to Amanda and demand a t-shirt, okay? Okay, I will. <laughs> okay. So um, this was good. Uh, I mean, we did some embryology. 
we did some uh, clinical presentation of dermatomal path. You guys, these things you can remember most of the thing we talked about. We uh, you remember about the interpretation of the films, especially remember to distinguish that. Uh, no, we are not going to do that one. Distinguish this picture from this picture. These are scout the localizer versus Zagitol and Kronos. And as well, we understood, we talked a little back, talked about the air in your body. Where is it normal? Where is the warning sign? So if you take these five things from this hour, you have done a good job, okay? That will help you no matter what you do later. It's going, these five things are going to be extremely helpful to you in your future career. Any question before we call it a day? I did have one quick question. Please, please. Yeah, if, we, if we go back to the spinal cord stem, um, is the probes inserted in the dura or is it on top, like on top of the dura? It is actually on top of the dura. It's in the epidural space. Mm. And, uh, um, uh, it would be a very, very dangerous thing trying to insert anything inside of the dura. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking as well. But I just yeah. want to now it is on top of the dura, but just by proximity it still works. What I don't like about this electrode, if you look at the electrode carefully, the electrode here, it seems to be almost on the side of the spinal cord. You mm -hmm. remember we talked about the dorsal column is in the back. If you put it on the side, you don't get the same effect. So this is the second, uh, this is a pathologic thing as well about this, that at this uh, probably when they put it in place, it was on the back where you want to stimulate the dorsal column. Now it, for some reason, sometimes it happens, it turned to the side and it become less effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, could you guys have a, a great weekend? Uh, it was great having you. Thank you, Christina, for moderating this. Thank you, Bassi. Yeah, and you know, you guys should actually um, come up with clinical cases, and then we can as well do a little more uh, something you guys are um, interested in. So yes. just forward the pictures or things that you guys are interested to Amanda. We yeah. put it together, and then we can as well discuss them, okay? okay because yeah, we... nature, most of the thing I have is going to be spine. Right. Maybe we want to expand it a little on other things. I still have some expertise outside of the spine. Okay. Yeah, we were talking to Neil about it. So we'll coordinate with him and Amanda to figure out some type of session where we can all send in specialties we're interested in. Sounds good. And this summer, we are going to do a boot camp. We are going to get a head of a person. Okay. An actual head. You can get it. You can actually get a, a head, severe head, a separate head. Okay. We are going to do a boot camp neuroanatomy, okay? Okay, sounds good. Okay.